The scientific study of cosmology certainly um, really began in the early 20th century with Einstein's formulation of general relativity. And so I've been tasked with giving a sort of crash course in general relativity for mainly aimed at those of you who haven't studied it for years or at least in course. Um, so those of you who have, uh, I'll understand if you tune out or you're welcome to ask you know, questions of interest to you. Or I'm also going to focus a little bit more on just sort of the basic physical and technical framework of it rather than kind of all the interesting philosophical questions that you might uh, talk about because that will simply take too long even though this is a great context for it. So feel free to ask any of those questions though. And we'll stuff. So <clears throat> I like to start talking about general relativity by talking about Newtonian physics. Um, that we presumably all know. <coughs> and Newtonian physics really has two parts. I'll call them Newton 1 and Newton 2. There's a part that tells an object how to move, that is, you give the second derivative of its position in terms of some force or uh, sum of forces that are uh, that the particle is subject, subject to. And the second part, the force that at least you knew about the gravitational force, um, which depends on two masses and is really thought of kind of as this instantaneous two body force um, that given some mass one, I can call this the force on two or I can call it the force on one, uh, for now I'll say two, gives, uh, if I make this, well, depending on the, how I define the R's, this gives the force on two in terms of just this instantaneous two-body reaction um, with mass one. Now, let's look a little bit deeper at these, um, starting with the new one. First, it's nicer to think of uh, F equals dPdt. You know that it's nicer because you can treat things like things that split in half and so on. Um, the momentum P is MD. And um, so this contains, in some sense, all of these three laws. You can see that if, um, if the net force is zero, then the momentum is constant, meaning that something sits at rest or travels uniformly at uniform speed in a straight line. Um, it's also the case that if momentum is constant, and by thing, you really need the center of mass of some potential system of objects. Um, and if the center of mass of that potential system of objects is constant, then that basically tells you that if you consider subparts of that and they act on each other, that they'll have equal and opposite reactions in the sense that the change in momentum under some duration of force has to be equal and opposite so that the sum stays the same. So you get Newton's. Uh, third law as well. So this really contains Newton's three laws of dynamics. Now, um, but there's, there's sort of a subtlety hidden in there, which is that when you say um, as Newton does, that, that things travel in a straight line, um, we have to talk about exactly what straight line means. That's intuitively clear to us. You know, a straight line is one that doesn't curve or keeps going in the same direction. Uh, and those are useful notions. But another useful notion for our purposes is that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. So we can take two points in space time A and B, consider all possible paths between them. introduce some Cartesian coordinates x and y, say, we can cut this straight line, sorry, cut this line into many infinitesimal segments, which are then, um, which we can then sort of expand. And as long as this line isn't sort of infinitely wiggly, when we expand them and make these small enough, we'll get a little triangle like this. We 
all the, maybe I'll use DL, putting all this hypotenuse DL, and it's clear that by chopping up this line into infinitesimal segments, we can measure the full length of it using its extension in x and y um, and integrating along the path. So we, so we say that the length of this thing is the integral from a to b, dl, say, and dl squared is dx squared plus dy squared. And then what we mean by straight is that given this relation between L and these little infinitesimal coordinate differentials dx and y, we can compute L, then we can consider all possible paths between A and B, and find the minimum length path between A and B, and we call that the straight line. So now straight is the minimal length, is the, the line of uh, minimal path. Now, this thing we can give, this, is, this object here is a very important one. It tells us if we've set up some coordinate system that we can use to label points in our space time. We can use it to label small coordinate differentials between two points, like this one and this one. Um, and given those two points and their coordinate labels and their, the differentials of those coordinate labels, it spits out a physical length uh, L. So I can draw this on the board with, you know, as 20 centimeters long, whereas this might represent in, in reality, you know, an intergalactic distance. And so this provides a translation between the sort of map that I draw on the board and the coordinate system that I draw on the board versus the actual physical reality. So this thing is physically real. This, these x and y's are at some level arbitrary in that I can clearly use a different set of coordinates, that x and y, uh, and I ought to get the same physical length out of it when I use that x and y, or some other one. So this thing that translates coordinate, uh, that, that tells you the difference between the physical distance between two infinitesimally separated points in terms of, in particular, in terms of um, their, the coordinate differentials between them, we'll call the metric. And this thing here is the expression of the metric for a simple two-dimensional <coughs> flat space in Cartesian coordinates. So those are a bunch of words that go along. Now, there's something interesting about this metric, which is that there are some things that we can do to our coordinates that leave this metric looking exactly the same. If we take uh, if we translate the metric, that is we just move the coordinates around, or for or if we rotate, just apply a, a rotation matrix to these things. Uh, it's not hard to show that you will get back uh, let me write it this way. That the expression for the metric in terms of x prime and y prime is exactly the same as it was in terms of x and y. So we say that the metric is invariant under this particular set of transformations, spatial translations and rotations. Um, <clears throat> and that's an important thing because it tells you something physical about the space. It really tells you that the, the space that's being described has these symmetries that it's the same if you rotate it. It's got a rotation and translation symmetry, this two-dimensional flat space that we've talked about. Uh, these transformations are also uh, often called the Galilean transformations. Um, they're a sub, I guess, it's a subset. Yeah. No boosts, yeah. No boosts, but you can have a time translation too, which I haven't talked about. Uh, but yeah, they're part of the Galilean transformations. Okay, so, so when we say so, so a, a fancier way to say what we mean by particles travel in a straight line um, when there's no net force uh, is that particles travel the path between two spatial points that is a minimum of the 
spatial distance is given by this metric. And obviously I'm saying all these things in ways that are going to be useful for thinking about it in more time. Uh, another note is that the, the two statements that, well, the, the two part statement that if there's no net momentum, uh, the center of mass of some system of objects will either be at rest or moving at a constant speed uh, in some direction. That speed can also be zero, so it's just, it's just sitting there. And another way of thinking about that is to say that if I just draw x and t, that an object. Uh, with no net force, follows a straight line, I'll put it in quotes, through space and time, or space time or something, only meaning at this point that if I draw the standard uh, one Cartesian axis here and time here, that with no net force, things travel a straight line where the line is uh, more tilted than the faster you move. Okay, so that's some elaboration on Newton equation one. Are there any questions about what I've done so far? Okay. Well, I have a comment at least that uh, mm -hmm. this is mathematics but not physics. You need an object, a reference of what moves in a straight line and we all know that that's, the, that's how light uh, goes. When you look at a ruler and you say it's straight, you, you have to see it that the light coming is straight. So, so it, it's meaningless, it's pure mathematics. You need a physical uh, reference which is the motion of light in uh, at least uh, local space is on a straight line. Uh, if you don't have that, I don't know how you can define straight lines physically. A straight line through in space time or in space? How do you describe a, uh, you know, physically a straight line? <laughs> not, not mathematically. Did I just do that? No, you did it mathematically. No, it's I, I said we measured the distance, the physical distance between two points and take the minimum possible. Yeah, but to do those measurements, you need to uh, describe. Uh, straight, uh, straight. Even the ele elementary things have to be straight. So it's a circular thing, unless you have a physical. I think the light is the crucial thing to allow uh, in us to define. space-time, I would agree that light. Uh, the straight line through space-time, I would agree that light is the, the critical thing. But I'm not clear. I don't see what's wrong with with saying that I define between these two points the straight line to be the one of minimum physical distance where I use a sort of physical, I mean ultimately yes I have to have some physical standard of distance that I can line up along that path. That's all I'm saying. Okay, yeah. So I, I agree that I need a, a base physical unit in order to determine what a physical length is and therefore what a straight line is. Uh, and those can come from, but I don't see why that can't just be some meter stick in France or something. Also. The meter stick is straight because light, you can look at the two ends and see that they are, they are coincident. And that is because the light travels from one end to the other on a straight. Otherwise, it's a crooked meter stick. Well, but aren't, you're <laughs> assuming that light travels in a straight line. Right? I don't know. So either way. Without that assumption, I, I don't see any physical way of determining what's straight and what isn't straight. That's all I'm saying. I can do it the way I do it in my garden. I take a string and I attach it to two stakes and I pull it as tight as I can and I pull that a straight line. Tighten the string, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, it's not exactly straight because it dips in the middle, I guess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't pulled it hard enough. It dips in the middle because, because space time is curved. It dips in the middle because space time is curved, right? It gets a little subtle. That's gravity. Um, okay, so point well taken that, that there, for any distance we have to use a unit and we have to have comparison to some defined unit of distance that we can imagine uh, comparing our physical length to, um, and, and we have to start from that. Uh, 
Okay, so let me go on to, unless there's other thoughts. Uh, so this was the uh, Newtonian force equation that is the gravitation, the universal gravitation equation. Um, the somewhat nicer way to think about this is in terms of some scalar potential phi. So we say that at each point in space time, there's this number that we call the gravitational potential. Um, each object has a property we call m. And that property, when combined with the number at its space time point, and in particular with the gradient of that field at that space time point, tells us what the force is. And this is very much like uh, the exact same, I guess I can. It's almost identical in, in this sense to, say, electrostatics, where we say we've got an electric field. At each point, we have a property of the object Q, which tells you basically how it experiences an electric field in terms of the force on it. And the electric field can be taken as the gradient of some scale of potential. Now, in gravity, we know exactly how to compute the scale of potential if we have some. Um, Distribution. So this is the density in, say, grams per cubic centimeter of uh, mass, or yeah, mass per unit. Uh, so there's a for a point mass, the Newtonian gravitational potential somewhere else is just given by that point mass. Newton's gravitational constant and the actual absolute value of the distance between the mass and the point where we're looking for the gravitational field. Uh, we can then do an integral over all possible masses, and that looks like this. That's the integral form. It's also often convenient to to take a differential form of this that relates second derivatives of this gravitational field phi to the distribution at, at a point to the distribution to the density of matter at a point. So this is called the Poisson equation. And these are identical formulations of the same thing. Okay. So in slightly fancier terms, we've now built up Newtonian gravity as being uh, there's a bunch of stuff scattered around. It gives rise to a field. And if there's, if the field is constant, um, so it's gradient to zero, then there's no force, and the stuff follows a trajectory of the shortest distance between two points. Um, if there is a force, then the second derivative of the, the particle's position follows that, uh, follows that force. Okay, any questions about that? So, so far I've basically done fancier versions of Newtonian mechanics. <coughs> okay. So now the thing that uh, looking back at, back at electromagnetism, something that was I'm sure this was known. Somebody knows the history. It, it surely wasn't Einstein that actually discovered that that. Uh, Electromagnetism wasn't invariant under the Galilean transformations. Somebody must have worked that out. Before. But anyway, electromagnetism, Maxwell's laws that govern electromagnetism, is not, as opposed to Newtonian mechanics, invariant under those Galilean transformations. So Poincare uh, certainly discussed this in 1904, if not earlier. And, uh, that's right, that's right. So he, because he, he specifically made the Poincaré transformation exactly. to fix this. Presumably right. Lorentz even earlier. Though. So did, I don't think, I think it was Poincaré who really whole, thought of it in a group the theoretic context. The for the ether hypothesis was the recognition that it wasn't invariant uh, it wasn't invariant under the Yeah, so, so what I wanted to... physical anchor for a preferred yellow 
Yeah. So, it's, so it's clear that the electromagnetism is just one speed of light, so you can't get the normal Galilean right. velocity addition formula. What, what I'm curious about is, because I've seen it, there's this little book by Einstein where he works out sort of explicitly showing how you don't get, Maxwell's equations sort of in coordinate form are not invariant under the Galilean transformations. I'm curious as to whether someone else sort of explicitly did that before, if they were just thinking in terms of the relative Okay. Yeah, I've never read anything by Lorenz. So. Uh, okay, so anyway, it was known prior to Einstein uh, that special relativity did not, sorry, that electromagnetism uh, did not have the same, these same symmetries as Newtonian mechanics. Uh, that in particular, uh, that Maxwell's equations give you a, just a particular value for the speed of light, whereas in uh, Newtonian mechanics, if you have, you know, an object with a speed in, uh, relative to a second object, and then that second object is moving relative to a third object, that the velocity of the first object with respect to the third object is given by the vector sum of the two relative velocities, the first to the second, and the second to the third. It seems obvious, and yet it's not true. And, uh, if it, it's incompatible with the idea that there is uh, something like a, like a pulse of light that travels at a fixed velocity in, all, in any reference frame. Uh, so, rather than keeping the standard sort of Pythagorean theorem metric of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared fixed or invariant, rather keep space-time metric which combines the distance through space with a sort of distance through time where there's this conversion factor C um, between the spatial distances and the temporal distances. Um, this is often also thought of, so this is often called the proper distance with units of length. We can also think of proper time, so this is just basically the same thing but scaled by a c squared um, with units of time. Both of these are measures of a sort of distance between two space-time points, which we'll call events. We can have two events A and B. If they're infinitesimally separated, we can look at the coordinate differences in x, y, and z directions and the time direction. We can assign this um, space time distance according to this formula. Um, and. Do you need a square somewhere? Did I do the square? Oh, yeah. Right here. Yeah. Uh, now, the motivation for this in some, well, a, a way to think about this is that if we, um, is that you, it's suggested by the fact that for light in electromagnetism there's a particular speed, c, the speed of light, that's got to be fixed. So at least for light, you want something of this form because you want, um, you want 
CDT to always be DL for a path of light, saying that the, the distance it travels is C times the time. So you can think of uh, the trajectory of a ray of light as something that takes, that is, takes zero distance in this new, uh, new metric. So, so in order to keep that distance kind of physically real, the zero that, uh, that light travels physically uh, the same, independent of coordinates, you have to have some sort of transformation law that contains time and space in the same metric. Um, and you can sort of show, let's see, uh, at some level, I think, you can either postulate this and then derive the Lorentz transformations from it or go the other way. Um, I think, yeah, logically you can start either place or the, the classic Einstein postulates that light travels the same speed in every direction um, and that there's no mean to absolute motion or direction. Um, you can use that to derive the Lorentz transformations, which many of you have seen in your undergraduate special relativity classes. Um, and from that, you can get to this metric, or you can go the other way and see this metric and derive the Lorentz transformations. One comment about the contrast, though, between Galilean transformations and Lorentz transformations. I mean, while the invariance of that metric captures the notion of um, Lorentz transformation, I think it's a little more complicated to relate Galilean transformations to the preservation of that of the Euclidean metric. You need to say a little more. Uh, you need to say something about how time fits in. Oh yeah, so, so one, so it might be useful, so, so if you're thinking about Galilean transformations, uh, You can think of uh, for example so if you think of the this is just a translation you can think of the, of the rotations too but a crucial point is that time uh, transforms separately under the Galilean transformations there's no connection between the time transformation it just sits there in the, in the Galilean transformations. Um, so there's just a, this absolute notion of time. Um, you know, you could redefine the scaling or something, but that's about it. There's time. So there's no connection between the two. Now what's crucial in the Lorentz transformations is because of this form, because space and time are connected here, that the Lorentz tra transformations have to mix space and time. Um, and in particular, something you lose in going from this set of transformations to the Lorentz transformations as being the sort of transformations under which physics is invariant is that the notion of absolute time uh, changes or that, that goes away in the sense that if you say that there are a set of events that happen at the same time t in, uh, in Newtonian physics um, then they all happen at the same time t prime as well. So there's no change in the meaning of simultaneous when you go from uh, one reference term to another. Whereas in special relativity, as, as you undoubtedly have heard or know, that's not the case. You can have a bunch of events that happen at the same time t, but in this other frame t prime, just described by coordinates t prime, they all happen at different times depending on their position. If these two frames have a relative velocity between them. So the so the, the <coughs> a crucial difference uh, is that space and time are chain are mixed up in this transformation, and that the notion of uh, absolute simultaneity between events goes away. Now, going back to our thinking about mechanics. Uh, we now have this new space-time metric and we now have a way to think about a space, a straight line through space-time
And that's one that uh, <laughs> So we now have this, I erase them with these, this meaning of um, So we now have this new definition of a space-time distance. We can calculate the total space-time distance between two points A and B. Now taking a half-through space-time or world line, it will often be referred to. And if we integrate this um, proper time which is more convenient if we're talking about a world line of an actual particle, uh, we can get different values depending on which path through space time it took. Um, and a straight line through space time we can take to be an extremum of uh, this space time distance. We can also use a more technical word for straight line, with G, which is geodesic, which is just defined as an extremum of the proper length or proper time between two events. Now, it's important to notice that uh, physical particles that travel slower than the speed of light always, um, if you look at these formulas, slower than the speed of light means that the tau has to be positive, the S has to be negative. So, a physical particle has to travel a path where Anywhere along here, I can take two points, compute the tau squared for them, and it's going to be positive. What that means, if I've set up axes with, say, x here uh, and ct here, so that light travels on a 45 degree path, that means that this path basically has to be vertical. It can't cross. Oops can't cross any of the light cones that I can draw anywhere along the path. They can't go more horizontal than the light cone because then we can travel faster than light. Don't you have the signs backwards on the right hand side? Uh, here. We have to tell oh yeah, I need... Um, minus 7. Yeah. Right. Well, that's good now. I forgot the third assignment for, for the internet audience. It was deep philosophical issues and assign errors. So, so now we have now we can imagine a prescription for um, thinking about particles that are not under the influence of any force. We can say that again they travel us. Uh, Now we can say in more precision what we mean by they travel through uh, along a straight line through space-time. We can say they follow uh, time-like geodesics, that is, vertical on a sheet of paper geodesics, which is an extreme of proper length or proper time. Note that whether it's a minimum or a maximum depends on whether we're talking about the proper time uh, or the or the proper distance, we're talking about uh, a time-like path like that a physical particle can follow. It would be a maximum of the proper time. This is incidentally the direct uh, origin of the twin paradox, which you probably have heard of, that if I take this path, someone who more or less stays at rest, another one that goes near the speed of light, um, there will simply be, by doing this integral, less proper time along this path than this one. This is the twin that stays home. This is the twin that flies off uh, in the fast rocket ship. Uh, and there it is. That's, you know, there's no, from this standpoint, there's no paradox whatsoever. Uh, they're just 
different paths through space time and have different lengths, just like two paths through space need not have the same length when they have the same two lengths. Tim Marvin would be very happy with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can, you know, yeah, we could discuss this more, but I think at this level, in terms of special relativity, they should things uh, that Now, <clears throat> oh, I should mention that for light, uh, as I said before, that the total path length is zero. Um, you can still compute an extremum. You can still uh, vary this quantity. And there's a whole, there's a bunch of math that I'm just skipping over because I clearly can't go through it in the technical details of how you take this integral along a path and, and let it vary arbitrarily and show that a particular path is an extremum of the path length. Um, so, so there's a whole set of mathematics behind that that I can't go into. Um, but is, is, I think, not conceptually important. Is that, but is that, so that's, is that different from just saying the s is zero everywhere along the path? Uh, yes, because you, so for example, this path, ds equals zero everywhere along the path, but it's not the gds. Or you could have something that kind of null, one in a, one in a null spiral or something. Uh -huh. So not all ds equals zero paths are geodesics for light, but all geodesics are geodesics. In, in cases of reduced symmetry, you can often get away with this. So, if, you know, if you, if you pick, uh, if you say the, the light has to travel, say, in a radial direction, then this will be enough to constrain you to the geodesic. Uh, now, um, So we have now, oh, oh, and one more thing, which is that if I apply that, um, if I just do that, given this metric and there are no forces, then I simply get the equation that, uh, how shall I write this? <coughs> D squared x to tau squared equals zero, and e squared t d tau equals zero. Uh, so doing that operation of varying this thing and finding out what is the extreme of a proper length gives me an equation uh, for the position and coordinate time of an object as a function of its proper time. And that path just looks like a straight line through space-time. So this, so we can, <coughs> Once we specify this, then we have an equation of motion analogous to uh, f equals dp to t equals zero that describes an object with no external force. Now, all right, so now we can talk about particles, you know, following paths through space-time and geodesics through space-time. But now I have to think about gravity. Now, it was clear uh, as soon as Einstein had formulated special relativity that this Newtonian gravitational law is not compatible with special relativity. Because you see right here, there's the physical length with no time mentioned at all. So this is not an invariant thing. Um, this is a non-relativistic thing. And you can convince yourself that it leads to problems or conflicts with special relativity um, in a more physical sense. For example, you in special relativity, it's unpleasant in various ways to have anything or any signal traveling faster than light. Um, but it's clear that you can do that easily with this form of a force equation. You can just have an object here and an object here with a very sensitive um, where the object here is hooked up to a very sensitive apparatus that determines the direction of the force due to this one. And then you can just wiggle this one back and forth or up and down like this. This force meter would shift up and down. 
And it would do so instantaneously because there's no time delay in between when the mass distribution thing changes and when the field somewhere else changes. And so by doing that, I can in Morse code, you know, signal to this one and I can, tra I can transmit information as fast as I like. So it was clear both just from looking at the sort of form of the expression that it's not invariant to the Lorentz transformations or that you can do things that, are, that, that would lead to paradoxes within special relativity that this is not okay. Now, so what to do about that? Let's see where I am. Am I really at an hour and ten? No. No, you started at 40. I'm at 40. I'm at 40. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have 50 minutes to go, roughly. Okay. You should have said, am I really at 10? Hmm? We used to start at 2. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, now a, a plausible thing to do might be to say, okay, instead of my gravitational field 5 just being this field that's uh, a solution to the Poisson equation or something like that, let me, let me do something like Maxwell's equations. I can make phi some field that's relativistic. I can come up with some relativistic field equations that are like Maxwell's equations, and, and then leave the rest of, uh, of Newtonian mechanics pretty much alone. That would be a nice way to make you know, a relativistic gravity theory, and, uh, and Einstein, I believe, actually had a theory like that at some point. Uh, but it's not the right way to go. And the crucial clue about how to do gravity correctly was given by this experiment that had been sitting around for a long time. Apocryphally, with, with dropping you know, lead and wood balls from the Tower of Pisa, but I believe was, was done with inclined planes by Galileo, that showed that the, both the trajectory through space time and just the instantaneous acceleration of all objects in a given gravitational field is exactly the same. That is, uh, That is, and this is strange in the following sense. Uh, if I have an object, uh, then I know that to accelerate it to a certain, at a certain acceleration, I have to apply a certain force to it. Right? And there's some intrinsic property of the object that resists acceleration. So the more acceleration I want to give it, the more force I have to give it. We're, of course, familiar with some objects like bowling balls require more force to give them a particular acceleration than other objects like feathers. And so we can call that the object's inertia or inertial mass. And it has to do with you know, a resistance to acceleration. Then we can also see that <clears throat> if we have an object in a gravitational field, um, there's a force on it that depends on the gravitational field and on some property of the object that tells you how strongly it's affected by the gravitational field. Just like the charge of a charged particle tells you how strongly it's accelerated in a given electric field. So there are two pieces of information for a charged particle, the field and some property of the object is charged. Here, you, you could imagine that in gravity, there's a gravitational charge that tells you how strongly something is affected by gravity that, when combined with the gravitational field, gives you its acceleration. Now, the strange thing is, of course, as you know, that um, it turns out that for a given gravitational field, this gravitational acceleration, all these vectors, is always the same independent of the properties of objects. That is, uh, for a given gravitational field, I can stick in uh, an object with the same mass of all kinds of different properties and get the same force. Uh, that I can stick in objects of all different properties and different masses and still get the same acceleration. So there's only um, well, I'll just say in words. If this is constant, if this is fixed, this is fixed, which tells you that the inertial mass has to be 
proportional to the gravitational mass that if you define your units in, in the correct way, equal to. And this is an empirical fact that Galileo discovered and has now been verified to enormous precision. Um, I think when I last looked it up, it was like 10 to the minus 16 um, was the difference between, the relative difference between inertial and, and gravitational masses that you could probe. Actually, uh, it, it was Newton that did this experiment. Uh, this was not in a framework that Galileo would even have understood. No, but he did the experiment. I mean, he, he knew that the acceleration of different types of objects was the same. No. No? No, that's, that's not Galileo. I mean, he may have rolled different kinds of balls down his planes, but he didn't even have a very accurate way of doing that. The, the first group that actually measured the acceleration of gravity straight down was uh, Bishop Mersenne in Paris, contemporaneously with Galileo. Okay, well, I'll have to look into that. Um, but Newton really was very much aware of this question. Yeah, and no, he no, actually he did sure. experiments with a precision that was something like a part in 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then but Ittrich I, uh, was the one who really started the modern program, I mean, in, in the 1890s of uh, doing it right. Putting it differently, Galileo didn't really have a good concept of the notion of mass. No, 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 he didn't think of it this way, but he certainly was, knew that heavy objects and light objects fell at the same rate. Yes, although the Pisa story is almost certainly apocryphal. No, but he has in his dialogues, he talks about how Aristotle yes. would say... No, no, the no, but there, no, his argument was, you take two objects and imagine there's a thread between them. It's not going to change the rate at which they fall. That, so he gives a, a thought experiment mm -hmm. uh, as his argument in, in the dialogue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, I totally agree that he did not think of it this way, but he, I would say that he did. He doesn't actually say he did the experiment. I mean, I remember that part of the dialogue, and, and he's giving this thought experiment. No, there's no evidence that he, he dropped it. I read recently that there was some controversy that people were claiming that he did actually drop the balls, but let's assume that he didn't. But I think, I thought that there was just evidence that he had done some experiments with rolling the ping pongs to support this. Um, but I could be wrong with that. Stillman Drake did a bunch of things with strobes and stuff to reproduce Galileo's experiments. And in the, early, in the 70s in Scientific American, um, there's a, he has a whole article on Galileo's discovery of the log free fall. Okay. Um, what was the name of it? Stillman Drake. Stillman Drake. Okay. Uh, in any event, it's true that uh, this is almost, if not exactly identical, identical to incredible precision, the inertial and gravitational masses of objects. Uh, now this. Uh, this is a kind of strange thing. It wasn't probably as strange to do because there weren't other forces lying around, um, other sort of fundamental forces lying around to compare it to. Um, but it is strange, certainly, when you compare it to the other forces that we know of now. But there is a, a very natural sort of explanation of this seeming coincidence um, that it suggests, which is Something that it suggests is that the trajectory, sort of the, the path the two objects take through space time, if you start them with the same, at the same position and velocity, just is completely independent of the, the characteristics of the objects. It's independent of their, their masses, it's independent of their compositions, if you take away you know, other forces that will just leave gravity. It's absolutely independent of anything um, that has to do with the objects themselves. So it's a little strange to think of it as a force between these objects and some other objects, as a force tends to you know, relate to the properties of the different objects, or at least their masses. With gravity, it seems that once there's a gravitational field, it just doesn't matter what sort of object this is. So something this might suggest is that it depends on something else um, other than the properties of the object. And the only other thing that's lying around is the space it's moving through. And so you can boldly imagine, as Einstein did, that gravity, rather than actually being a force, as considered by Newton, that is sort of two bodies interacting, is a property of space-time, that these bodies travel through space-time in a straight line, but that the structure of space-time is altered such that it appears that 
they appear to take, say, through space, a curved path. So that was Einstein's postulate that uh, three particles travel along geodesics. Um, through an interesting space-time. And the, the way you can uh, mathematize this is precisely as before, to say that they follow a path of extremal proper time between two events, and that, but now rather than just the special relativity metric um, here, we can have something more interesting and more general as the relation between space time points um, and the distance, the physical distance between them. The space -time. So, in a, a sort of Interesting example of that is if you take the metric um, 1 plus 2 phi over c squared phi is a function of x. This is just the regular Newtonian gravitational potential computed in the usual way. So you imagine you have a bunch of masses sitting around you compute the normal Newtonian gravitational potential. So suppose you just make up this metric and say, here's a metric. There it is. Depends on the Newtonian gravitational potential in that way. If I send phi to, phi to zero, um, this just becomes the regular Newcastle metric. It turns out that if you take this and compute the proper time between two points and externalize it, and note that uh, x is fixed, so we're, we're imagining that phi is uh, static and small, so we're going to go to first order in phi over c squared. Then by extremizing this path, what you find is that you can recover uh, the acceleration is minus grad phi for some object. There's no mass in here uh, because there's no mass anywhere here either, right? You're just saying objects follow this path of extreme uh, proper time, that this is the metric that you use to compute the proper time, that you go through the calculation, you find this. So this is <coughs> um, so this is the sort of way in which you get uh, a particle's interesting motion through space-time out of making some alteration in the space-time metric. It looks like over there that if phi were simply constant, so there was no gravitational force, nonetheless the motion would be affected by that form. Uh, no, well, I think you, so the metric would look a little bit different, but I think when you extremize the path, you would find that it doesn't. Okay. It only, it'll only depend on your Um So that's kind of interesting, because it shows you how you could get a, a so-called metric theory of gravity. That is a theory where, you know, the, the influence of gravity on an object comes through changing the metric rather than sort of applying a force to the object. The object here has no force on it. Um, but it's not relativistic. Because it's still depending on this non-relativistic, uh, non-relativistically computed Newtonian potential. Um, but 
to think about, and, and the real problem here is that, uh, you know, this, well, this is static, so we have to think of a metric that uh, can depend in interesting, way, interesting ways on time, and we have to think of, uh, we have to think of how we can relate the metric to uh, the, the source of gravity, to energy, uh, um, in a more relativistic way than is given by the, the previous description. So let's think about more general metrics. Now if we have um, you know, this little, say this little infinitesimal interval, and these are three orthogonal axes, then there's, there's a little bit of freedom here in the relation between the distance, you know, on this diagram, or in these coordinates, and the physical distance. Because these are orthogonal, we, we sort of know that we can calculate it using the, the three-dimensional Pythagorean theorem, but we don't exactly know the relation in scale between some interval in this coordinate and some interval in the real physical space. So this could be, you know, the scale, I can easily draw a three-dimensional map where the scale in this direction is, you know, one inch equals 10 miles, here one inch equals 20 miles, here one inch equals 30 miles. It's still a useful map but I have to know and keep track of the fact that the scale in the three directions is different. If I know that, if I know the scale in the three directions, then I can easily take two points on the map, rescale them into, three to, into the physical lengths, and then add them up using the Pythagorean theorem to get the physical length of this. So in other words, I could say E L squared equals sum scale in the x direction, and then some scale in the y direction. And then some scale in the z direction. Where I've labeled these with two x's and y's and z's for reasons that are clear or will be clear soon. Um, so these are just three scale factors that I can apply in those in translating between the coordinate differences and the physical distances. Now if I do these orthogonal. If they're not orthogonal, then other terms could come in when uh, translating between these two. Uh, and those terms would look like things like g, say xy, dx dy, g x z, dx dz. You could have a term like g z x d z dx. But that's just going to combine with the, this one, so I might as well, there's no sense in um, sort of separating these two. It's, it's simplest just to define something where gxz equals gzx um, and use it to and describe these two terms at once. I didn't say that very well. Um, well, it, it'll become clear. So I can have terms like that. So I can have basically. Um, all the terms that combine two infinitesimal coordinate separations with some scaling factor, or some, some coefficient. Um, and if I want to write that fairly generally, I can write it as the sum over i and j, dij, dxi, dxj, where x, uh, 1, 2, and 3 is for x, y, and z, and i is the 1, 2, 3. Um, so these are not powers, but just superscripts that tell you which coordinate you're talking about. Is there a question? Uh, and this is a double summation over i and j. Now, 
So that will cover something in space where the, the sort of coordinate axes are orthogonal or not and have different scales or not. Um, but we want to talk about space time, so it's convenient to let x0 stand for the time coordinate, and then we can use another set of variables that rather than running from 1 to 3, run from 0 to 3. These are usually used. Greek letters are usually used for these rather than uh, Latin indices for those. They go from 1 to, zero, 1 to 3 rather than, sorry. Greek indices going from 0 to 3 or Latin indices from 1 to 3. Then, um, then we can write a four-dimensional metric in much the same way um, as the sum over mu and nu going from 0 to 3 of g nu nu dx nu dx nu. So same form, so this is uh, a 16 term sum. Uh, some of the terms, as, as I said before, you can kind of combine together because you know, dx1 dx2 is the same as dx2 dx1. So we can describe it that way. Um, so this is an entity. This thing can depend on space-time position. And this is the thing here that essentially is, is the entity that translates between the coordinate infinitesimal distant differences and the physical space-time distance. So this is the metric again. We can think of this as a, a 4 by 4 symmetric matrix. Uh, you can show, so any matrix is composed of a symmetric and an anti-symmetric part. You can show an anti-symmetric part of G would, would contribute nothing when it's signed over each. So you only really need the symmetric part. Uh, There's one of these at each point. Um, you can also describe it as 10 independent functions of position. Uh, so a 4 by 4 symmetric thing has 10 independent numbers, and the other 6 are related by symmetry. Uh, so 10 independent functions of position. And this is the thing that describes the structure of space-time in the sense of giving you physical distances between uh, infinitesimal separated points. Let me pause for questions there. I think I've achieved half lost and half bored. As long as it's 50-50, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Can I just ask a quick, I'm having trouble seeing the board from here. The, the metric you have, how many in, um, indices do you have on the metric there? So each one of these has four values. So there's two indices with well, four What's values. that above that number? Oh, uh, this, sorry, this is, oh, okay. um, let me write it out. That's expressing that it's a function oh, of okay. space sorry, time yeah. position. Sorry, I you, you have to say anything about the signature at this point? Um, well, we just sort of stole it. Yeah, I should. Um, so in order for this, let's see what I want to say succinctly. Um, we want to include special relativity here. So this, an example of a relevant metric should be the special relativistic metric, which looks like uh, e0, 0 equals minus 1, and g1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, equals plus 1, um, where I've gone to units where uh, c equals 1, that is, we use units in which we measure, um, you know, times in meters or distances in seconds by setting c equals 1, and you can consistently do that. <coughs> that is convenient for removing a bunch of c's from this 
So this is so an example of this general metric is the special relativity one, in which case the um, components of the metric take these values, they're zero otherwise. Um, and um, let's see what I want to say. It will try to think of what uh, for any met for any valid metric, uh, it will be a four by four symmetric matrix that if I diagonalize it um, will have a minus one, will have a positive, a negative, positive, positive, positive. Uh, in the diagonal elements, I guess. So then you were asking about the signature. So the signature of the metric uh, is given by if you diagonalize the metric and take the signs of the diagonals. Um, special relativity has minus one, 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 one. In general, they could be different, but this is always going to be negative and these positive. Uh, that is something you can't change by changing the coordinate system. It's sort of an intrinsic property of the space-time uh, that make that, from a more fundamental standpoint, gives you a, the real sort of a real difference between time and space. If this was plus, then time really would be the same as space from a from a uh, relativity standpoint, other than you know up to a factor of scale which we've gotten rid of by setting c equal to 1. So this is really the thing, this minus sign, that sets time different from space that makes uh, that uh, means that you can travel you know, faster than the speed of light. You can travel into the future or maybe be influenced by the past, but not places that are separated from you by more than, but, you know, that you would have to communicate faster than light to get to and so on. Uh, it's why you can't you know, walk to yesterday and things like that just because of the statements in that signature. Now, so this general metric tells you all kinds of stuff about the structure of the space. You can't walk to yesterday, but you can walk to the future? Um, no, you can't, you can't walk to the future either. You okay, can't. fine. No, no, you can't walk to the future. It's even harder to walk to yesterday. Um, <laughs> but you, you can't you can't change your temporal direction with the same obvious ease with which you change your spatial direction. So uh, once you have this sort of general metric, there are all kinds of interesting space times you can describe with it. Now I really am down to 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but let's continue to look at the structure of the theory. So now we have this general form of the metric, and we want to do the same thing again. Let's extremize the tau squared, which is now just minus ds squared. So you can go through the same mathematics. Um, and it's mathematically painful the first two or three or four times you do it. But you go through the same mathematics, and what you find is you get an equation for the second derivative of the time with respect to the proper time, that's d squared x0, d tau squared, and space. So previously we had zero, when we were talking about special relativity. So this is the equation of motion for a free particle in special relativity um, in the Minkowski metric. Now we get something more interesting. Um, we have four equations for the four values of lambda. Each one of them looks like a sum of 16 terms, where these two can take, uh, each one 
each can take four different values. And it's the set of coefficients. These things also depend on space time. Um, times the first derivatives of the position with respect to the proper time, the four dimensional position, so the position in time with respect to the proper time. So this is the new stuff we got by giving space time an interesting structure. These things um, well, they're called a connection, but I'll make them into Christophelsons in a minute, but they're called Christoffel symbols. And these are uh, 40 independent numbers. There's 40 because it's this, these things are also symmetric in mu and nu. So for each value of lambda, this is a 4 by 4 matrix of numbers. So for each lambda, there's a 4 by 4 symmetric matrix of numbers. So that's 40 total independent numbers at each space time point. And these are, these come from the 40 first derivatives of uh, the metric. So there are 10 independent components of the metric, and there are four things with which I can take derivatives with respect to, uh, the four space-time directions. So that gives me 40 first derivatives I can construct, and these things are made up of those 40 first derivatives. But I, I, what you, once you have the metric, right, the Christoffel symbols are completely determined. Yes, that's right. But the metric consists of, you said it was a 16 by... Uh, the metric is a 4 by so 4. So the 40 functions. number, I mean, you take, it's a, these are functions, therefore, you don't get anything, you don't count by derivatives. I don't understand what you mean by 40, by the number 40. Um, at a given point, so, so there, so there if may I be pick 40, a point. There may be 40 numbers, but they're all calculated from, from the, from the metric. Okay, there, there are, 10 independent functions that make up the metric. And that's it. There are, four, there are four first derivatives I can take of those 10 independent functions. That gives me 40 first derivatives of the metric at a given point. So why do you say the derivatives are not independent? Are not independent? No, but at a given point. At a point. Just think at a given point. A given point. They're independent at a given point. You fix that point. Yeah. So, so I, can, I can write, say, g, you know, 0, dg01, dx0 evaluated at some point p. So that's one of the 40 different numbers. Sure. There are 40 of those, and combinations of those 40 numbers make up the 40 just opposite ones. Uh, when space time is flat, that is in the Minkowski metric, these Christoffel symbols are all zero, and you recover as you wanted to the, the original equation for a straight line through space time. Now, these Christoffel symbols in this way of writing things is pretty elegant because it covers, they, they really do sort of three things at once. Um, the first is, suppose you just take um, special relativity but in some funny coordinate system, or just say spherical coordinates. Then, other than the, the point is, other than radial paths, the, the straight line paths in spherical coordinates are kind of ugly. Uh, they're not, in particular, d squared x lambda d tau squared equals zero if these x's are time r theta and phi rather than time x, y, and z. So a beautiful thing about this formalism is that you don't have to let these be x, y, and z. You can let them be any four uh, coordinates you like, and once you express the, the metric of flat space-time in the correct coordinates, so you can write down the metric of Minkowski space and spherical coordinates, compute these Christoffel symbols, um, and they will spit out for you the correct um, equations for a straight line and spherical coordinates. So one thing they can do is handle different coordinates. So 
are completely general in that sense. Um, another interesting thing is that they will handle um, different reference frames in the sense of handling uh, fictitious forces. That is, you can, so suppose you have an inertial frame where Newton's laws hold as usual, and then you pick some other frame that's accelerating with respect to that one, or rotating with respect to that one. Then you know that Newton's laws don't then apply in that frame, rather Newton's laws only apply if you introduce some extra fictitious forces uh, that, that represent the fact that you're accelerating with respect to the inertial frame. So if I take um, you know, this car and accelerating at speed A, then this passenger feels this mysterious force, you know, pushing them to the back of the car. And we say in various ways, well, that's not a real force because actually they're just trying to sit still and the car is slamming into them. Uh, but from their standpoint, it feels like a perfectly real force and you feel something pushing them to the back. Those come immediately and directly out of this formula also. So a term like this, where a force is pushing you to the back of the car, will, will show up as one of these Christoffel symbols that gives you an acceleration toward the back. Are one and two really different? Um, let's see. Um, it depends. I would say that two goes a little bit So in terms of, maybe not, so, so if space-time were, were just flat, then certainly they would be the same thing, I would say. Um, except that uh, the way you think of this is a little bit different. So um, Represent this frame as some new set of coordinates that just follows the car along. Uh, but I think it, it's a bit more significant uh, in that. How do I want to say this? Um, see, it, it's what's in one of the. <laughs> I'd say interesting things about um, this framework is, is that it blurs the line between uh, fictitious forces and real forces in the sense that, um, as well, I'll say this now, uh, so in a sense they are, but maybe I'll say a little bit more about in what sense. Um, so the third thing that they can describe is gravity. Um, that comes from the non-trivial metric of the space-time. So, so these are in some sense both, uh, these would both apply to, you know, to the regular Minkowski metric uh, with no gravity. Uh, if you have a non-Minkowski metric, then you'll get additional forces because you don't have a Minkowski metric. And those forces are, in some sense, what we call gravity. But it, there, there's a fine line between those two. So if you, uh, if you just look at the metric inside the car, uh, it's true that this, if you look at the metric inside the car, uh, by going, taking the coordinates attached to the car and transforming the metric, um, well, I said that either. Um, yeah, let, let, let me say something about it later. I, I, I keep being about to make statements that I don't want to say, so I won't. Uh, so, if, so if the space-time structure is non-trivial, then you get some extra forces from that non-trivial space-time structure. 
that we generally call gravity. Uh, now, this is rather interesting in connection with this one um, because of, of a whole uh, set of thoughts that I skipped over. Um, but were very important to Einstein about the equivalence principle. So the idea is, if I am sitting in some closed room, uh, and I have some objects that I can play with, then if I drop that box at, in free fall, so it's accelerating down at the speed g, that Einstein postulated, and this is the is a sort of key postulate of general relativity, that the physics inside this box, if the box is small enough and non-rotating and other stuff, is exactly the same as a box out of intergalactic space with no gravity. That is, you can sort of make gravity go away by going into a free-falling frame. A corollary of this is that if I'm sitting on a planet with some gravitational field g, it's exactly the same as if I'm out in intergalactic space, but with some acceleration of my box this way of G. So what the equivalence principle shows you is that um, what we previously call fictitious or inertial forces, like this one, are in fact exactly the same thing as what we call gravity. I mean, the, the description of them is identical. And in a real sense, we can think of gravity um, the gravity we feel in this room as being fictitious forces caused by the fact that the ground is accelerating upward with respect to the local inertial frames. The inertial frames that, in which Newtonian mechanics applies are accelerating down, they're kind of falling through this room. With respect to them, we're getting accelerated upward by the floor. We feel this weird fictitious force pushing us into the floor, and we call that gravity. But it's really no different from this force that's pushing us toward the back of the car. So there's kind of a, um, there's this very interesting way in which uh, gravity and fictitious forces get very much, uh, have very much the same sort of status in general relativity uh, as, as really manifestations of the way in which local inertial frames are kind of stitched together on a larger scale. The, that in gravity there are these changes in the local inertial frames as you go from place to place, um, and the same in a system like this as you go from time to time. So that's what I wanted to say that I was fumbling about earlier, but I'm not sure if that answered your question. Anthony, one, one thing that I think people often find helpful is if, you, if they understand that in Newton's framework, fictitious forces are always proportional to the mass, and forces that are proportional to the mass are always fictitious. That is where any object, regardless of what it is, has uh, an acceleration that's force divided. I mean, or uh, to put it differently, it's the acceleration that's important, and it's independent of the mass. As yeah, follows immediately from your Christoffel. No, no, certainly that's, the first part I totally agree with, that fictitious forces are always proportional to the mass and can be described in this way. The fact that, I suppose it's true, yes, that if, if, if there's a force that's only proportional to the mass, you'll always be able to find a frame. You'll be able to relate that by some acceleration to a frame where there's no force. So you exactly. Can go like, yeah. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah, that's, that's useful. Thanks. Okay, now. So this thing here, the geodesic equation, um, is the general relativistic version of Newton's first equation, that is, that equals the PDT. So this, this tells you, given some, this, this is sort of how gravity tells things to take a particular trajectory. But we're missing the second part. Um, what replaces the Poisson equation in relating the, the 
gravitational potential, in this case, to the distribution of matter. So, previously we had, we, we saw this Newtonian metric that had phi as part of the metric coefficients. Um, and if we look at this, it tells us that it's second derivatives of phi that we want to relate to the matter distribution. So this is kind of suggestive that we want to relate second derivatives of the metric to the matter distribution. Um, these things contain first derivatives of the metric. So this is so in a vague sense we want to um, relate first derivatives of the Christoffel symbols to the density. Now, so we want some mathematical entity that is made up of first derivatives of Christoffel symbols, and it's something that we can relate um, in our framework to some description of the energy density. Now, one thing I haven't said much about is curvature. But it's clearly a, a key point because if we think about what, you know, why are our paths not straight? Um, well, sorry. Why are paths interest? Why are straight paths interesting um, in a different metric? It's telling you something about the fact that the space or space-time that you're going through is curved. Um, in the same way that if you, you know, if I take a sphere. And I'm asked, what is the straight line path between two points? I have to think a little bit before I do that. You know, I can't, I can't draw it quite as immediately. I have to do a little bit of the calculation. It's, in fact, part of the great circle around the sphere. Um, and it can have a fairly non-trivial connection with the, say, latitude and longitude, which are the which are natural set of coordinates covered in the sphere, or some little patch of Cartesian covered coordinates on the sphere. So it would look like a kind of odd, potentially slightly odd path in those coordinates, um, but it's the straight line path. And that's because the surface of this thing is curved. Now, space-time can be curved, and there is a, there's, there's a whole beautiful set of mathematics in which all of this is part um, reminding in geometry that works has worked out <clears throat> descriptions of curvature um, that are all based on the metric, the Christoffel symbols, etc. So this thing R mu nu is an enemy called the Ricci curvature tensor. There's actually, it's related to another one called the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, but don't worry about that one. We'll use this one for now. This is like the metric of 4 by 4 uh, symmetric matrix at each point, or a set of 10 uh, independent functions of space time. But it's built up of second derivatives of the metric. So it has to do with space-time curvature, and it's made up of second derivatives of the metric, so it's an interesting entity for the purposes we have in mind here. Um, yikes. Okay, but I want to I at least say Einstein's equation before I stop. Um, there's another 4 by 4 symmetric entity called the energy-momentum tensor. which has things like the energy density of stuff in it. So for example, um, if you just have slowly moving pressureless stuff, non-relativistic stuff filling space-time with some density rho, the energy momentum tensor looks like this. There are all kinds of other components that describe flows of matter and pressure um, and conduction and all kinds of things, but that, it's that in simplest form. So this, uh, this entity basically can encapsulates everything you need to know about the uh, amount and motion of matter, energy, and space-time. 
And conveniently, it has the same number of components as R. And so it's sort of natural to imagine an equation in Einstein did write it like this at some point that relates the Ricci curvature tensor to the energy momentum tensor. Um, where there's something, there's a G in here to re reproduce Newtonian mechanics. There's some pi's and eights and stuff in here. Um, so this is a natural candidate. This, it turns out, does not work. That's not quite right. But you can make something that's very close to it. Um, if you compute R, which is a, basically the trace of R, the trace of this matrix, and you write down a very similar equation, Then this turns out to work um, in the in the sense that this is a it's a metric theory. It's built out of the metric. Um, the changes in the metric tell you uh, the interesting things about particle trajectories as they travel geodesics through space time. Um, these things are I haven't talked all about general covariance and tensors and things, but these are nice mathematical entities um, that are not tied to any particular coordinate system. It's all relativistic, um, and it's a theory of gravity in the sense that there's a connection between the structure of space-time here and the presence of energy here, where the structure of space-time then tells stuff um, how to move, and where if I take the the weak limit of this, that is, if I take uh, small amounts of matter that are slowly moving and so on, and imagine that the curvature is small, then I can actually derive that metric that I showed you before, the Newtonian metric, that is the weak field metric of general relativity, and you can show that you then get, um, I already asserted that you get from that metric and the geodesic equation, you get Newton's first equation that, um, or, or you get that the acceleration of particles goes as the gradient of the gravitational potential. From this one, under that same set of assumptions, you can show that um, in the weak field, then you get perhaps very pi equals 4 pi g rho. So it's a relativistic theory that uh, reduces to Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian gravity in the non relativistic limit. Um, and appears to be true in terms of all the, the experimental tests that have been done to get it. So I have a bunch more to say, but I'd better stop there, I think, and take maybe a few questions. I don't know what the time and situation is. I mean, we're going to start again uh, with Lenny's talk at 3.30. 3.30, yeah. Okay, so a few questions. Maybe, maybe I'll try to work in a few of the notes that I made that I want to see. Let, 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 I make, let me make a, a brief comment. Uh, since you started with Newton, uh, and you should actually read Newton's Principia, he makes a big point about expressing uh, the uh, laws of physics in terms uh, in terms of the gravitational forces in terms of curvature. Curvature is a, plays a major role in his description. This is something which is entirely forgotten. Curvature in the, of what? The curvature of, a, of an orbit. An orbit is not a straight line. So as soon as you have forces, means that you don't have straight lines, you have curved lines. And therefore, the curvature of that line is intrinsically related to the nature of the force. So it's kind of amusing to, to realize that it, Newton started his, uh, his work thinking in terms of curvature. Yeah, except that those curves of Newton's are now all straight lines. Pardon? <laughs> Newton's curves are, in fact, straight lines from, from the GR perspective. I'm just saying that the <laughs> point is that the mathemat there's an interesting relation that curvature already plays a role in Newtonian mechanics that is generally forgotten. In the You're saying that Einstein parlay Newton's curved lines into curved space-time. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not curved space-time. Well, that's the crucial difference. Right. Well, no, they, I'm not saying but, it's the but same. I'm saying but in particular, only that the notion lines. of curvature yeah. plays already a major role. And the other point yeah. I want to make is that one should remember 
that uh, Hilbert also played a major role in, the, yeah. in describing the correct equations. And at least historians call them the Einstein-Hilbert equations rather than the Einstein equations. So. Oh, I've never heard that. I've heard the, the action called the Einstein-Hilbert action. But I, I mean, uh, Einstein was quite confused and he gave lectures in, in Göttingen, uh, after which uh, Hilbert, of course, then knew from a mathem the, the correct mathematical way of expressing it. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of friction at the time. Let me take that to make a note which is that um, the, the derivation of, a ge you know, of geodesics from uh, this thing is often called action, so this is, a, this is variation of action, externalizing action to get that path. You could do something similar for a field theory, like the gravitational field, so you can write, uh, rather than carrying a path from say A to B, you can vary the fields in some space-time region. So you can say some action is integral over some space-time region. So a four-dimensional integral over that space-time region. To make that integral mathematically right, you need the square root of the determinant of the metric, but don't worry about that. That's just doing integral properly. Um, time some thing a Lagrange density, that sort of plays the role of this metric, um, the thing that you're integrating to get the action. And then if you vary that action and externalize the action, you get, just like here you got some equations of motion, here you get some field equations. Now it turns out that if you stick in here the simplest possible thing you can imagine based on the curvature of space-time, that would be this Einstein, sorry, the, the Ricci scalar, that's the scalar curvature that you get from the Ricci tensor and the Riemann tensor. This thing here, um, and I guess to really do this, we have to put in the Lagrange density for stuff. But if you take the simplest possible scalar you can use to integrate over space time, this thing, when you externalize it, in fact, spits out the Einstein. So this, is some, this thing here is often called Einstein-Hilbert action. Um, and if you couple it with L, you get the full Einstein equations, including the energy momentum tensor. Well, sort of by definition. Um, so the two R's have nothing to do with each other. This, no, this is a region and that's. So I wanted to mention that um, because this is the way you actually often think about uh, general relativity, if you want to change it in some way, uh, it's often easier to work with the, the action or Lagrangian formulation of the theory to make modifications to it than it is to, to work with the field equations. Yeah. Um, so, for a given physical situation, how do I obtain methods? Do I get it by solving these equations? Or? Yeah, so this is great. You're going through all the points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, so yes, if you, what these Einstein equations are, um, I erase them, but what they are is 10 nonlinear, whoops, uh, second order partial differential equations relating the second derivatives of the metric to this energy momentum tensor. Now to, to solve that, so what you ultimately want is the, the metric in some coordinate system as a function of space-time. So you want to find solutions, self-consistent solutions to those 10 nonlinear second order PDPs. That's really hard. Um, so there are two sort of approaches that people take in general to do it. One is, um, well three maybe I should say. One is uh, simple uh, T mu news. For example, T mu equals zero is a simple case. Um, so that gives you, uh, it's not immediately obvious, but that gives you R mu nu equals zero. That's still a pretty complicated set of equations, but it's easier. Um, and you can find solutions to this. Um, those are the so called vacuum Einstein equations. So you can, you can find. You could do some simplifications like that. Um, 
You can employ symmetries. If you select spherical symmetry, for example, it cuts down the number of equations considerably. Um, if you pick spherical symmetry and vacuum, it turns out it cuts things down completely and there's a unique solution to that. That's the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, so you can get a lot out of assuming symmetries and, and simplifying that way. The third is, uh, I would say, numerical. So maybe there's maybe four. Uh, perturbative. So the third is numerical, which is that uh, you can solve for the, so you can try to find a solution to the metric and density and, and energy momentum tensor at some time. And, and that's not trivial to Yeah. Just a quick, I must be misunderstanding something. It, 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 shouldn't there be a shouldn't there be a solution with T mu equals zero and spherical symmetry corresponding to Minkowski space? Yeah, so that's the M equals zero version of the Schwarzschild solution. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so numerically you can you can look for a solution at a given time to a reduced set of equations, some set of constraint equations, um, which is also hard to find a solution. But once you do, you can then evolve that forward, say numerically, to get a full spacetime solution. And that's a, a major program in numerical um, astrophysics, especially looking, you know, solving things and trying to understand the structure of black holes and gravity waves and things. And then perturbative, you can assume that the metric perturbations are small and find uh, a linear version of Einstein's equations that turns into a wave equation, which you can then look for solutions to. You get gravitational wave solutions, and then you can, uh, and other, other weak field uh, perturbations. And those you can solve a lot more simply, because those are generally linear, second order. Or, uh, yeah, generally linear, and then if you assume some symmetry, it's fairly simple to uh, equations and stuff. So there, there's a whole industry of different ways of doing it, but the ultimate goal is to find some self-consistent space-time where you have a reasonable team you do at a metric that could solve the equations. I think we should stop here to give people time for some refreshments. Yes. Okay, thanks.